أعوذ أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونشكره ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونشهد إن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد محمد عبده ورسوله رب الشرح لي صدري وسر لي أمري وحل الفقطة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم everyone so it's a it's an absolute honor to be here with uh, some amazing beautiful sisters I got to join in right as I was um, hearing the the last bit from a sister speaking about the connections I think that was you Noor um, speaking about the connections uh, made through YM the sisterhood the bonds um, and subhanallah that's you know exactly what I I needed to hear you know as we come out of a period of time in our nation in the US um, for difficult years in which we saw um, our nation's president, uh, you know, denigrating people of different backgrounds, of different ethnicities, of different faiths. Um, we've seen the Muslim ban, we've seen the uh, horrendous situations at the border, we've seen the uh, moratorium on refugee intake, um, and we've seen an atmosphere that developed here in, in the US, in the country where many of us have been born, have been raised, have lived our entire lives, um, an atmosphere that became um, very exclusive rather than inclusive to those of different skin colors, those of different races, those of different backgrounds, and definitely those of different faiths. And as Muslim women, for many of us, we do wear our faith on our sleeves or, you know, we wear our faith on, on our heads in the form of the hijab. Um, and celebrating, you know, the hijab with World Hijab Day is, it's, it's a beautiful sentiment in that it's a day where we can come together and um, speak about our own personal journeys with the hijab, where we can come together and speak about our struggles with the hijab. We can speak about wanting to wear the hijab. We can speak about maybe having worn the hijab and then not being able to continue wearing the hijab. We can speak about the way that the hijab uplifts us. And I think what's most beautiful about the sense of sisterhood um, that you know we were opening with, that we were talking about, is the fact that each and every young Muslim woman has her own journey, that each and every young Muslim woman is going to have her own struggles. But as long as we begin with the understanding and the recognition that the hijab is an act of worship, that the hijab is a, a mandate in the Quran, as long as we begin from the understanding that just as our salah is mandated, just as a, you know the commandment to be good to our parents is mandated, just as the commandment to you know not lie, to not backbite, to not steal, to not kill, to not harm another is mandated, mandated for the good of our own hearts and mandated for the good around us, the hijab is also mandated as something that is uplifting, something that that helps us as, as Muslim women to be able to wear our faith out loud. So Bismillah, you know, it's interesting because this morning I had uh, woken up and, you know, after, you know, getting everybody settled and everyone into their online schooling, everyone fed breakfast, everyone kind of set up and, you know, I headed into my office um, to get started with the day. And, you know, I had gotten a little ping um, and I'm absolutely horrible on social media as, you know, many of your parents might be as well, but um, that gives away my age a bit. But, um, but you know, I got a little ping, you know, from Twitter. And so, you know, I, I opened it up um, and I saw that it was the flyer for World Hijab Day. It was, I guess it was the, this flyer for this event was posted under um, the World Hijab Day thread or, or tweet, whatever it is that it's called. Um, and underneath it, there was a question. And that question seemed incredibly sincere. You know, I could tell it was coming from someone who was not Muslim. And the question was asking, you know, what is the age at which uh, Muslim women are, you know, supposed to wear hijab? And is it a commandment or, or something to that effect? And, you know, um, I don't normally respond on Twitter. I, I'm, I'm very, very bad at using Twitter, but I was like, oh, this is such a good question. The person is probably really seeking answers. Um, and so I responded. 
And um, this is the first time I, I began to understand when people will talk about Twitter wars and the Twitterverse, it's like a whole other world out there. Um, so I responded to the question um, and, you know, I explained that uh, hijab is, you know, in, in Surah An-Nur in the Quran, we see that verse 30 and Twitter cuts you off and knowing how wordy I am and how like I usually write a novel for each uh, question that I'm asked. I was like, wait, why is it cutting me off? Um, but I, I, I managed to figure out how I could keep responding. Um, and so, you know, I, I explained that, you know, in, in Surah An-Nur, you know, verse uh, 30 in Surah An-Nur is the first commandment that we see in the Quran towards modesty. And that first commandment towards modesty is actually not a commandment towards women, but it is a commandment to men, that the believing men are commanded to be modest. How are they commanded to be modest? They're commanded to be modest by lowering their gaze and by protecting their private parts. And Allah Azza wa Jal guides the believing men to modest actions. And then the following verse is a verse that is addressed to women. And in that following verse, Allah Azza wa Jal also commands women to be modest. But the way that the women are commanded to be modest is slightly different. And in that verse, Allah Azza wa Jal commands that the women gather their head covering and to bring that head covering over the chest. And we've seen different, you know, um, sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll see different words translating what that covering, what that covering word means. Um, but when we understand hijab contextually, we begin to understand what it means. Now, before I, I go into the explanation and the understanding of how we understand that verse and, and, and how it relates to hijab, I want to go back to the Twitter verse and, and the situation there. So, you know, I tried to give an explanation. I explained, you know, that it, it's a commandment of modesty. It's, um, it's a part of, of how we, you know, continue in our worship of Allah, how Muslim women are able to articulate their, their faith in, in a way that is visible. Um, and, you know, I spoke about how, you know, it's after puberty is, is when um, this is the stage in which we are, are in, it's incumbent upon us to act upon the commandments of the Quran. And, you know, this is where we are truly entering into that realm of young adulthood. Um, and we begin to uh, follow those guidelines um, and, and really follow the commandments in the Quran. And, you know, there was a follow up question, and then there was a follow up question, and then there was a follow up question, and then it seemed like it was just questions that were intending to be argumentative. Um, and subhanAllah, I just kept thinking how fascinated people tend to be Muslims and non Muslims with this hijab with this cloth that we cover ourselves with, with you know, what it is that we show of ourselves. And the thread was focusing on choice and whether or not hijab was the choice of a woman. And the reality is that every single day we make choices. Every time we wake up, we open our eyes, we get out of bed, we make a choice. We make a choice to set our alarm the night before with the intention of waking up for Fajr. We make a choice to physically get out of our beds, enter the bathroom, especially on a cold, snowy New Jersey day, you know, and, and use that water while we're freezing and make wudu so we can pray Fajr. We make a choice every day, whether we're gonna sleep in bed or we're going to get up. We make a choice when we're with our friends, whether we're going to laugh at the expense of someone else or whether we're going to stop that laughter and end, you know, or leave a gathering in which there may be gossip. We make a choice whether to tell the truth or to lie. We make a choice as to what we look at and what we expose our eyes to on the internet. We make a choice whether to tweet or retweet. We make a choice whether to post or not post. Our lives consist of choices. We make a choice whether or not we wear hijab. And we make that choice, not lightly, but we make that choice based on so many different circumstances. It is a commandment that Allah Azza wa Jal has given us in the Quran, but we choose to follow that commandment. We choose to honor ourselves and to really exhibit that sense of worship by obeying this commandment of Allah. So it is a choice. It's a human choice and it's a choice that can sometimes be difficult. It's a choice that sometimes we struggle with. It's a choice that, you know, when you're having a really good hair day, sometimes you might be like, oh man, you know, my hair is looking really good today, right? But every day we make that choice and we choose to follow a path that can sometimes be difficult. Why? 
Because when we go back to that verse in the Quran and we go back to understanding contextually the history behind the hijab, behind the commandment of the hijab, we begin to understand the elevation of the female in Islam and what our hijab really means, what it means to us, what it means to the world. And then we begin to understand the obsession with the hijab. Because I can't tell you how many times, you know, pre-corona, of course, when there was a lot of travel going on, but how many times I'd be invited to lectures at different universities or different organizations, and the title of the lecture would be Beyond the Veil, you know, lifting the, the veil, um, what is hidden be beneath the veil, um, and this obsession with, you know, the removal of the veil uh, in order to understand or uncover. Um, and again, these were mostly, you know, non-Muslim organizations that would be holding these events. Um, but it's, it, it is an, uh, uh, really being consumed almost with the idea of the hijab. And many times it's because of a lack of understanding. And many times for us, even as Muslim women, we may struggle with understanding. We may struggle with explaining that which we may not fully understand. So today I really want to kind of go on that journey of understanding, understanding not just the historical and Islamic implications of the hijab, but also what the hijab means today. What does it mean to me? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to the social media influencers? What does it mean to the world around us? So contextually, we know in the time of the Jahiliyyah, prior to the advent of Islam, prior even to the advent of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we see that historically women were, would always wear a veil, but the veil was often translucent. And we see this exhibited most commonly if you were to enter any Catholic church, for example, if you were to look at any pictures online depicting you know, what the Catholics identify as the Virgin Mary, what we of course identify as Maryam alayhi salam, but visual depictions will always show a translucent veil that is upon the hair, often with some of the, the hair showing and the chest often bare with a, a somewhat of a low cut bodice. And historically this wearing of the veil was a symbol of honor for women. So a woman who held an honorable stature in society would wear this veil. And this was symbolic at that time. But a woman, for example, who did not have that social status would be forbidden from wearing the veil externally. And there is a, a narration of, again, prior to the advent of Islam, we see a slave woman who left the home of, of her master where she was serving once, and she threw a veil over her head and she was beaten for wearing that veil because she was not considered someone who occupied that status, uh, that social status. Now, when we see this, this verse in the Quran, we see that Allah Azza wa is commanding that the covering, which is the head covering, which was traditionally worn by women in society at that time, being uh, the women are being commanded to pull that covering to also cover their chest. And we see that this is a commandment to all the believing women. It was not a commandment just to the women of a certain status, the women who had a certain amount of wealth, the women who you know, occupied a certain space in society. It was a commandment to all the believing women. We also recognize from the sunnah of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which guides us to understanding the commandments of the Quran, a hadith in which the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, was speaking to Asma bint Abi Bakr anhu, and he uh, spoke to her of, of dress and he said that that which should show of a woman is this and this. And he pointed to the hands and to the face. And so we begin to understand the hijab contextually, we begin to understand it Islamically. There's a, a beautiful narration of a woman who had was in the marketplace when the verse from Surah An-Nur was revealed. And she heard this verse and she stopped in her tracks and she refused to move. And she asked one of the, the people that was nearby her to run home and to fetch her a cloth. And when they said, why are you frozen in your tracks? Why aren't you moving? She said, I fear to take one step without wearing the hijab now that the revelation has been revealed that this is a commandment. And so subhanAllah, when you look at, you know, the faith, the, the, the pure iman of the Sahaba of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, of those who surrounded the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when a revelation was revealed, when a verse from the Quran descended upon the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he conveyed it to his people, there was no 
moving forward against that verse from the Quran. It was understood to be a commandment from Allah Azza wa Jal, and the next step was to obey that commandment. Now today, sometimes we struggle a little bit. We grapple a little bit with the obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal. And you know, it's, it's beautiful to see that in the Quran, one of the most repeated words, we know that, that one of the, the, the repeated words that is most often seen is Rahma or, or the variation of Rahma, which is mercy or compassion. But we also see the word ilm, which is repeated several, several, several times in the Quran. And ilm is knowledge. And the reason why ilm is so critical and why it's repeated so often in the Quran is because it's, it's a commandment that goes hand in hand with iqra, with reading. It is incumbent upon us to seek knowledge. It is incumbent upon us to understand. It is incumbent upon us to, yes, follow the commandment of Allah Azza wa Jal, but to also understand that commandment, to also ensure that we are following that commandment in the way that inshallah is most pleasing to Allah. So what are we seeing today with the hijab? So it's, it's interesting when we see how, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, um, hijab was a complete anomaly here in the US. Um, it wasn't something common. It wasn't something that you would see in advertisements. Um, and, you know, I remember the first time, uh, I think maybe it was about four or five years ago, I was uh, I was on a flight and I remember it was it was a Delta uh, airplane. And, you know, on the back of the seats, they show the um, here's what you should do, you know, in case of, of emergency, um, you know, thank you for flying with Delta. And it was a flight, it was a, a domestic flight. So it was in the US. Um, and with the thank you for flying to Delta, there was a group of, you know, happy, smiling people. And right in the middle, there was a woman wearing hijab. And I remember I stared at it because I was like, wow, like, you know, you don't see this normally. Maybe it was about six years ago, I'm thinking now, because it's become more common. But at the time, it was, you know, something strange for me to see because I wouldn't see normally women with hijab in mainstream advertising. I wouldn't see women in hijab in mainstream anything. Now, when you look around today, we see, you know, a, a young woman wearing a hijab in uh, Spider-Man, you know, for what was it, Spider-Man Homecoming or something? I, I remember when I first saw it, I kept hitting rewind and play, rewind and play, especially when she says like, I love pizza or something like so normal like that, you know, something so American. Um, and I remember I was like, this, like, you know, this is a woman wearing hijab being a Muslim American woman, right? And we started to see it more and more on um, the concept of the hijab being a, a part of the dress of those who identify as Muslim American women, just as it is a part of the dress of those who identify as Muslims in so many other parts of the world. And so now we have, you know, individuals like uh, Sister Iqtihaj, for example, who um, is the fencer who you know, broke a lot of barriers wearing her hijab. Um, and you know, I remember Sister Ibtihaj is a, a fellow New Jerseyan. So I remember her from you know, when she was younger and you, know, you, you see the, the breakthroughs that she's made, not as you know, a, a Muslim woman doing you know, quote unquote Muslimy things, you know, because this is the narrative for a very long time was that, that if you're gonna show a, a Muslim woman wearing hijab, you have to show her in the desert of Arabia, or you have to show her um, you know, in prayer, not doing anything else. But the truth is, as Muslim American women, we do so many things, you know, yes, we pray, but we also fence and we also go online and we also become doctors and, and teachers and nurses. We also save lives. We start organizations. We, we do so many things that align with worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal in that path. Because by wearing our hijab, we are consistently you know, going through that act of worship, just like that narration I shared with, er with you earlier of the woman who didn't want to take a step without her hijab, because taking a step with the hijab would be a form of worship every step that she takes. But what happens when we see young women who wear the hijab, who may be doing things or, you know, taking part in actions that may not align with that which we know to be most pleasing to Allah? What does this mean? You know, I've seen, for example, images um, recently, you know, of, uh, I, I, I can't recall which store it was, but a young woman wearing the hijab, but also wearing like, you know, a, a tank top, you know, but the scarf was kind of thrown. And it felt 
almost like a bit of a cultural appropriation of our hijab that, you know, um, or we see sometimes, that, again, there was a, a television show, I believe, where the woman was wearing hijab, but she was also smoking weed, you know, and this is, again, something that we see, and, and this is media, we know, but we also see this sometimes on our college campuses, we see this sometimes in our high schools, we see this sometimes in, in so many other places, but subhanAllah, you know, this is one of the tests, and one of the tests for us, you know, as sisters as a Muslim ummah that it becomes easy sometimes to judge with the visual because when we somewhat see someone for the first time it takes three quarters of a second for our eyes to process the visual and to send a message to our mind based on what it is that we see and this is why they often talk about the first impression being so important because that visual roadmap that visual click that we kind of make when we see someone it sends a message to our mind and because the hijab is visual we often have our own stereotypes associated with it just like the entire world may have stereotypes associated with it assumptions thought processes, decisions about what a woman in hijab should do and what she shouldn't do, not always aligned with the Islamic values and the Islamic beliefs, but sometimes just aligned with societal expectations. And so we, when we you know, kind of send that visual message to our mind, we do have to be aware of our own shortcomings, our own faults. You know, one of the, the beautiful uh, Islamic sayings is that we should busy ourselves with our own faults so much that we should not be able to notice the faults of others. So when we see a sister wearing hijab, you know, our first uh, thought process should not be, oh, she should take off the hijab because her jeans are so tight. Or, you know, I don't know why she's wearing hijab because all she does is hang out with guys all day. Or, you know, well, she curses left and right. So I don't know why she's wearing hijab. Because in that moment, we may be the ones that are committing the transgression. We may be the ones that are displeasing Allah in that judgmental state of mind. But the reality is I may wear my hijab, but I may have a really, really hard time getting up for Fajr. I may struggle with fasting in Ramadan. I might be the one sneaking Oreos out of the pantry during Ramadan, you know, because I just can't handle the hunger. But you can't see that. So you see me in my hijab, and your assumption may simply be, oh, she wears hijab, you know, and, you know, she's, she's wearing hijab. That must mean she's a good Muslim. But I may have my own struggles. Maybe I struggle with lying. Maybe I struggle with, you know, a, a pornography addiction. Maybe I struggle with, you know, texting or tweeting. Maybe I struggle with a relationship that, that is haram and displeasing to Allah. Maybe I struggle with my sexuality. Maybe I struggle with being good to my parents. Maybe I struggle with a drug addiction. And you don't know that because every single one of us sins, but we sin differently. And every single one of us who sins has to have full faith and hope and qana'a in the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. That's what Allah Azza wa Jal means when he reminds us in the Quran, la taqnatu min rahmatillah, knowing that each one of us is going to be on our own journey. And if my struggle may be internal, that doesn't make it any less of a struggle than an external struggle. So the social media influencer who wore hijab for years, and I'm not sp speaking about a specific one. I know there's there's many that are out there um, and you already know how incompetent I am with social media. So I, I don't know anyone specifically, but you know, I, I hear from young women all the time that there are social media influencers that wore their hijab for years, that built their platform on hijab and then took their hijab off. It's not for us to say, you know, this is ridiculous, or I can't believe it, or for us to denigrate or put this person down. It is for us to reach out and be a sister. It is for us to, to stand up and say, what's going on? Even if we don't know this person personally, you know, what do they say? Slide into the DMs, you know, slide into the DMs and, you know, give the sister salam. Maybe there's something going on in her life. Maybe there's a struggle. Maybe she needs someone to talk to. Maybe you are meant to be the answer to the sister's dua. Maybe the sister has spent nights crying, asking Allah Azza wa for the strength to be able to continue in her journey. And maybe she struggled. And in that struggle, maybe she's fallen. And this is where we have to understand that it could be any of us. 
And this is why it's so important that we ask Allah Azza wa Jal, Ya Muqallib al Qulub, Thabit Kalbi ala Dina. O changer of the hearts, keep my heart steadfast on your faith. Because I might be in this talk today and I might be gathering with my sisters, remembering Allah. And tomorrow, if my heart is not anchored securely, if I'm not constantly asking Allah Azza wa Jal for hidayah and for keeping me on the straight path, I may be the one that has fallen. I may be the one that needs reminding. I may be the one that needs a sister. So before we judge, before we start thinking the worst about someone who may struggle with the hijab, the first step and the first question we have to ask ourselves is what does this person need? How can I advise this person? And when we look at you know, Surah Al-Asr, one of the shortest surahs and one of the surahs that we tend to pray with the most. You know, I think all of us, when we're trying to you know, get our Salat Al-Dhuhr in you know, between our classes or you know, get Salat Al-Maghrib in before Isha comes in, we'll often you know, pray with Surah Al-Ikhlas, which is a reminder of the oneness of Allah, or Surah Al-Asr, which is you know, a, a reminder of Allah swearing by time. And yet in that surah, Allah Azza wa Jal reminds us that surely human beings are at a loss except for those who do good deeds, those who believe and those who do good deeds and those who advise with truth and who advise with patience. So it is incumbent upon us to advise but to advise with kindness, with patience, with compassion. And sometimes that advice is not, you know, to kind of lay the smack down and be like, how could you, you know, why would you take off your hijab? I can't believe you. But it's to kindly, compassionately to listen, to understand, to ask our sisters what's going on, what they're thinking about, what it is that they're struggling with, and to open our hearts because we all struggle. We just struggle in different ways. So I know we wanted to leave some time for question and answer. I was trying to kind of peek at the schedule. I believe um, I believe now was the time that I was uh, asked to wrap up so that we could have some time for question and answer. So I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal allows us all to remain steadfast on his deen, allows us all to find the strength and the courage and the sisterhood and the companionship that encourages us in our ibadah and that allows us to grow stronger and stronger in our faith and more sincere in our worship of him and him alone. Zakal khairan amin ya rabbil alameen. Um, so many beautiful points that you touched upon. Um, personally, my uh, greatest takeaway was about the woman who was in the market and she stopped and you know it just makes us realize that so many times we hear something and like we want to implement it but we're like okay tomorrow okay maybe when I'm married or I have kids I'll start doing it but you know this was a great example of how like samana wa atana right you we hear it and we obey it um so inshallah um you know that was just so there's so many good things and i'm sure everyone wants to i'm sure everyone wants to like share their thoughts but we also want to just keep on squeezing your brain out so we do have a couple of questions um one of them is asking as you mentioned the hijab covers the head and the chest but i see many women and girls not covering their chest the um they only cover their head so is that the correct way to wear the hijab can you explain the correct way to wear it so Jazakallah khair for asking that question. And that's a great question. I think I have this pop up on my screen that I need to remove. Okay. Um, so again, if we turn to the hadith of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the narration um, of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speaking to Asma' bint Abi Bakr, in that narration, um, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam points to the hands and to the face as being that which should show. We also understand the verse in the Quran in Surah An-Nur, it clearly says to draw the covering over the chest. Now, sometimes you'll see um, cultural interpretations. Um, for those who may be uh, from Southeast Asia, you'll hear sometimes uh, some people saying, well, I wear my... Um, is it the jibutta? I believe that's what it's called, that, that, that gets thrown over the shoulders. Like there's a shawar kameez and there's a jibutta and that, you know, I wear that jibutta and it covers my chest. And, you know, the commandment in the Quran says to cover the chest. And when you look at literally speaking, the translation can be the covering is drawn over the chest. 
But contextually, and this is why we turn to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to guide us to understand how to put the Quran into action. Contextually, you understand that the covering that is being referred to is not a shoulder covering. It's not a covering that was worn on the back of women. It was a translucent covering that was worn on the head. And so when the commandment is to cover the chest, it is to pull that head covering forward and to cover the chest. We also know that in that narration, and in, in a slight variation of the narration of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that there was also a, um, a, a pointing out to uh, Asma bint Abi Bakr that uh, clothing should also not be translucent. And so this is where we understand that it's it's not a sheer or a translucent covering, that it has to be a covering that um, you can't see through. Mm. Okay, okay. Um, kind of relating to that, someone is asking about, um, you know, they get confused when it comes to makeup and tight clothes with hijab. Um, does the proper hijab kind of allow this? Um, it's kind of just emphasizing more on kind of like the whole rules and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And subhanAllah, this is where, um, again, you know, when we look simply to the verse in the Quran, Right? There's no mention of makeup, right? We, we don't see the word makeup. It doesn't say don't wear Maybelline or don't wear cover girl or, you know, um, I don't know, don't go to Sephora. Like it doesn't say any of that in the Quran, of course, right? But we do know that there is a reference to adornment. And then the question then becomes, what is adornment? Right? So if the adornment of a woman is something that enhances, right, something that um, artificially tries to draw out a, a side of her that may not express modesty. Because again, we know that the first commandment in Surah An-Nur about, you know, that that's directed to the believing men is a commandment of modesty. Tell the believing men to be modest, essentially. And then the next verse, 31, tell the believing women to be modest. So what is our hayat? What does it mean to be modest? It's not just modesty in dress, but it's modesty in action. It's modesty in the way that we carry ourselves. It's modesty in the way that we respond to people online. Um, it's, it's a whole persona. And part of that modesty, we have to ask ourselves as well that, you know, if I'm wearing the, you know, the, the really uh, uh, long lashes, you know, or if I'm um, putting on, you know, a, a lot of makeup, am I transgressing and moving into that space where I may not be protecting my modesty anymore? And that's a question that, you know, there's, um, there's a narration when uh, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the Sahaba came to him um, and asked him, how will I know if something is clearly right or clearly wrong when I'm unsure or in doubt? And the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, istafti qalbak, that, you know, ask your heart. We feel it, you know, we feel, this is my right heart is yes. <laughs> you know, we feel it like in our heart, like, like we will feel when something is iffy. And if someone's asking the question is like, oh, is it okay to wear makeup? You know, I think that's where you really have to ask yourself if my hijab is a form of modesty. And even if I struggle with wearing the head covering, you know, maybe I'm, I'm still at a place where I am wearing the jibutta, but I haven't been able to, to put the head covering on yet. Even then, really asking yourself, am I exhibiting modesty? And am I doing something that might take away from that modesty? Um, and I think in that moment, like you'll know the answer. Yeah, inshallah, such a great answer. <laughs> um, just like, okay, uh, someone is asking uh, your advice on being international with hijab. Um, oh, intentional, intentional, sorry, not international, <laughs> like treating it as a form of worship and constantly working to improve it instead of just throwing it on without thinking about it. SubhanAllah, that's a, a beautiful question. And, you know, it sounds almost like um, like a statement, like a wonderful reminder. Um, you know, the, the, the buzzword that we kind of hear a lot now, especially with COVID and the pandemic is mindfulness. You know, practice mindfulness, practice mindfulness. But really, what is mindfulness? And when you look at intentionality, that's essentially the heart of mindfulness. So being mindful with your hijab means that when you do wear your hijab, doing it with that intention of not, I'm just throwing a cloth over my head, but I am committing to an act of worship. It's like when we enter into our salah and we raise our hands and say, Allahu Akbar, right? We're not just Allahu Akbar and you know, running into our salah. No, we are literally lifting up our hands and intentionally putting everything behind us. Anything that had happened that day, the bad day, the bad test, the fight with our friend, the, and we're saying Allah is greater than all of this that I put behind me. And when we place our hijab on our heads, when we cover ourselves, when we choose to you know, comport ourselves with modesty, reminding ourselves again of what is my intention? You know, 
am I putting on my hijab just to get my mom off my back because she keeps nagging me about wearing it? Am I putting on my hijab just to, you know, deter guys because, you know, I don't want them bothering me? You know, and these are all, you know, maybe these are valid reasons and maybe they're part of, of what makes you put on that hijab. But go back to your core intention. And as you're putting on that hijab, make it the, that intention. I am wearing this hijab to please Allah. I am not wearing this hijab so that I can, you know, get a million followers on, on, on Facebook or on YouTube or wherever. I'm not wearing this hijab so that I can be seen as, as a hijabi influencer. I'm not wearing this hijab so that I can fit in with this crowd. I'm not wearing this hijab to please this person or to, ter to deter this person's attentions. I'm wearing it to please Allah. And having that intentionality, subhanAllah, it's, it's such a, a change in how you feel about your hijab as well. Yeah. Um, all right. So we have a, a lot of uh, great questions coming on. So this one is asking, how do you reconcile being a hijabi and not being as practicing sometimes? Um, I think a lot of us can relate to that one. <laughs> um, that's, that's a great question. And I think we have to look at our ibadahs, our acts of worship, um, as, as each one is an act of worship. And each one is a way in which we're trying to draw nearer to Allah. None of us are perfect, right? It is only Allah Azza wa Jal who is complete perfection and the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who is the closest to perfection. And we can only follow in the footsteps of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions of the Rasul who followed him. And so when we think about our hijab and we think about things that we may not be doing. So for example, maybe I wear hijab, but as I said, I sleep in and I miss Fajr every morning, right? That doesn't mean that I should take my hijab off, right? If I miss Fajr, it doesn't mean that I don't pray Dhuhr or Asr or Maghrib, but sometimes we find ourselves doing that. Like, or maybe we'll start the day off praying Fajr and we're all excited and we're like, yeah, like I got my prayer in. And then, you know, Dhuhr, we're running to pray it. We pray it a little bit late. And then, you know, Asr, we squeeze it in there. And then by the time Aisha comes along, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, forget it. Like, you know, like I missed Maghrib. There's no reason to even pray Aisha. But Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us that each action that we take is an action that can draw us nearer to him or an action that can pull us further away. If our hijab is one way of drawing nearer to Allah, then let's not remove it because we're lacking or lagging in other areas. No, we ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to strengthen us in those other areas. So maybe I wear hijab, but I hang out with the wrong crowd. Maybe I wear hijab, but I, I smoke weed. Maybe I wear hijab, but you know I talk back to my parents. Maybe I wear hijab, but I, I struggle in other areas. Don't kind of decrease one form of ibadah because you feel like there's others that are, are lower or, or you're not meeting where you should be. Instead, work on increasing and work on bringing up where the other levels are at to match where you're at with your hijab. All right. Um, so last two questions, inshallah. Um, thank you so much again for your time. Um, we learned that the hijab is an honor for women, but if we explain this to a non-Muslim woman, they can get offended because they think that we're implying that they're, they're not as honorable um, and that we're disrespecting their bodies. How can we explain it to them in a way that doesn't make them feel bad about themselves? All right. <laughs> So, you know, again, I think we live in an age of political correctness, and sometimes we're so worried about stepping out on other people's toes, but we're commanded to advise with truth and advise with patience. And the advising with truth is very important. But I think one of the best analogies that I'll often make when I'm speaking to a non-Muslim audience about hijab is that when you look today, you know, a, a bride, for example, one of the, the aspects or the elements of bridal wear that has come down, you know, from, from way back when, you know, from the pagan times even, is a veil, right? And the women wear the veil. And a lot of times when you ask women, well, why does the bride wear a veil, right? They say, well, because, you know, it's, it's, it's her day, you know, it's, it's her day to be honored and it's, it's her day to kind of stand out maybe, it's her day. And so when we look at the symbolic nature of the veil, even for those who are not practicing of any faith, you know, there is a sense of understanding that the veil does have that symbolic nature. But when we present it in a way where it's, it's an act of worship, 
It is an elevation of women when we look at the historical context. You know, it's, it's a way for women to be able to wear their faith out loud. And it is a choice. Again, it's a choice that women choose to follow a specific commandment of Allah's. It doesn't step on any toes. It's not an explanation that is meant to offend. You know, it's, it's truth. And we can't be afraid of speaking our truth because what we see today is that sometimes we're so keen to hear everybody else's truth, we almost water down our own truth. Don't water down the truth that Allah Azza wa has gifted us with. Allah Azza wa has gifted us with the truth, with a capital T. That's a truth that we want to be able to share. We want to be able to speak about. Will people be offended sometimes? I think, you know, the way that you say things, sometimes it has more of an impact than what it is that you're saying. When the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave da'wah even to the harshest of kuffar, so many of them believed in la ilaha illallah. So many of them, you know, their hearts were turned because of the character of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because of his compassion and his empathy. So when we speak about our hijab, we need to worry less about offending people and focus more on being true true to our deen, true to ourselves, true to the word of Allah Azza wa Jal and his hikmah, because he knows us better than we know ourselves. Yeah. Um, and something that I've heard is that if we eventually water off our deen so much, like we're not going to be, like we don't even tell them about Islam at the end of the day. We just tell them what they want to hear. Um, and that's literally the opposite of Islam. Um, so inshallah, last question. Um, I know you mentioned uh, to not judge hijabis who take it off, but is it also, um, but it is, but it's also very demotivating, especially when girls, you know, are taking it off. Advice on dealing with this and not submitting to, to peer pressure. Right, that's, that's a great question. And you know, again, I think today more than any other time, we live in a very visual age where um, you know we look at Instagram or Snapchat or, or TikTok and it's all about what you see. And so what we see can have an impact on us. And subhanAllah, this is why you, you look to, again, those verses in Surah Al-Nur, they're so beautiful because you know that first commandment to the, the believing men is lowering the gaze. And we often think like, oh, it's men who have to lower the gaze. But the reality is that our eyes are the windows into our own souls not just because other people can look into them but because of what we look at and what we allow our eyes to see if we see a young you know social media influencer or, or an old one you know or whoever it might be um you know taking off the hijab or you know doing their hair or you know uh wearing the hijab in a way that may not be as modest as it might be you know in that moment we we see we have that visual our eyes are going to send a message to our mind. Let's make sure that the message that's sent is one that's pleasing to Allah. So rather than thinking like, oh, you know, she looks so much prettier without her hijab, I can still be a good person if I take my hijab off. Instead say, you know what? I'm sure she is a good person. And she probably went through a bit of a struggle to you know, decide or make this decision. And that's something that's between her and Allah and make dua for the person, make sincere dua for the person and make dua for yourself. Because again, we never know what state we may be in and when we might be needing of someone else's dua. So make dua for the person. Don't find yourself falling into the pitfall of praising that which you don't know because you have no idea what that person may be going through. Maybe this is a young woman who just went through a, a very abusive relationship and you know, wearing the hijab was something that she associated with that and she felt like she needed to remove it. And maybe down the road she'll heal and inshallah she'll go back to it. You know, maybe this is someone who is struggling in another area of their life. Maybe this is someone who you know, has is, you know, is, is great in terms of prayer, but, you know, is still trying to find their footing in terms of dress. Again, we cannot be the ones who pass judgment, but we can advise. Again, the minute you have a thought about a social media influencer, and if that thought is one that's unkind, stop yourself. Find out how you can message this person or, or shoot them, them a comment or something. Send something kind, send something compassionate, send something encouraging, send something that draws them back to the beauty of Islam. Because we are the ambassadors of our deen, whether we wear hijab or we don't wear hijab. As Muslims, as those who identify with this, this, this deen, this beautiful deen, 
we are ambassadors of the deen. And our character, our actions, the words that we say, how we carry ourselves will affect others. You know, I'm, I'm going to share. I don't know if we have time, but I have, I have one last quick short story that I want to Of course, to we have time. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Good, good. But, uh, you know, there was this, um, this brother uh, who had converted the uh, quite some time back. And, you know, being a curious person, I always love to hear uh, conversion stories. You know, what is it that brought you back to Islam, you know, or, or um, what made you revert to Islam? And so I had asked him and he had said, well, I met Muhammad. And, you know, I was like, oh, like Muhammad who? Muhammad, you know, at the, you know, halal meat store or Muhammad from the masjid or, um, and he was like, no, I met Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So of course I was kind of like taken aback. I'm like, wait, what? Like, you know, like in a dream or something. And he said to me, no, he said, I was searching. I had gone, you know, to churches. I had gone to Buddhist temples. I had gone to synagogues. I just felt lost in life and I couldn't really find meaning. He said, it was one day in Ramadan and I entered a masjid and it was at Maghrib time. And he said, you know, I knew enough about Islam. I had been reading a little bit about it to know that people were fasting. He said it was uh, in the summer when the day was really, really long. And it was like, I entered the masjid and I sat down. And he said, you know, as the adhan, the Maghrib adhan went off, um, you know, someone, a volunteer was handing out dates and water. And so there was a very old man that was sitting beside me. And, you know, as the volunteer handed him the date, you know, he looked at me and he realized that the volunteer had skipped over me, probably, you know, assuming that I, I wasn't Muslim. He said, you know, it, it seemed like vis visually I wasn't. And so the old man turned to me and gave me the date. And he said, I told him, no, 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 I'm not fasting. And the old man who had been fasting for, you know, 14, 15, 16 hours, however long the day was, you know, refused to take the date. And he insisted that I take it from him. And he said, in that moment, I knew that I had met Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the character of this man. Because in that moment, I saw a Muslim man who hadn't eaten or drank anything all day. I saw a Muslim man who truly loved for his brother, who he had never met, who wasn't even someone who shared his faith, but truly wanted for him what he would have wanted for himself. And subhanAllah, I, I always get emotional when I think of that because to think that a man accepted Islam because of a date, because of a simple action. Imagine how powerful our actions can be. Imagine if we reach out to a person in need. Imagine if we, by the grace of Allah, are the means by which someone finds comfort, by which someone finds peace, by which someone feels something other than rejection. Imagine the izzah and the honor in that. So I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal allows us all to experience that honor and to be those of the character of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in all of our actions, whether we struggle with hijab or whether we wear our hijab proudly and confidently, may it always be a crown that brings us closer to our creator.